In his thought-provoking expose Stealth War, retired Brigadier General Robert Spaulding makes the case that Industry 4.0 infrastructure must be a national imperative and that Western nations are engaged in a silent war against China with significant implications for society. On June 3, 2021, General Spaulding, industry visionaries John Cowan and Jeff Deku joined Dr. Laura Roman to discuss and debate the role of data, edge computing, and how this global stealth war may play out. We've seen firsthand, you know, the power and relevance of this data and the way that I kind of classify this, this shift that's going into the third generation of the internet is, is by describing this move from applications that are in the abstract, like all the mobile apps and the things you see in your, your app store, if you will, to a, a, a very real world of applications where code and data are responsible for uh, directing traffic and, and critical infrastructure and deciding whether or not a car turns left or right or flying a drone or what have you. You know, as a B2 pilot, you, the things that we're taught uh, at a strategic level in terms of warfare, one of the most important targets that you can that you can go after is infrastructure and particularly that infrastructure that connects the leadership to the people and the leadership to the military. And, you know, so what, what are those communications nodes? What the Chinese Communist Party demonstrated in that in that presentation was that actually politics was war and politics really meant that using uh, influence over companies using influence over data and individuals, particularly as it applies to uh, 5G, you know, is a completely different way of looking at the problem. And, you know, so when I was a defense attache in Beijing in 2017, and you could use your phone to order food and, and then walk into a restaurant, have a camera do facial recognition and have the server greet you by name and hand you your food without ever having to touch your phone again to complete a transaction or pull out a credit card, you know, that really taught me the power of what the Chinese were building. And we also to make sure that we, we stay steadfast on, on moving forward and, and, and making these things resilient. And I, I will point out that when we talk about resilience, there's a certain level that we were already taking with a pin to make it harden like a, an ATM machine. But trust me, what uh, Rob's talking about is his hardening is far more advanced than that. Um, it uh, even goes to EMP hardening. There was a time that you know people didn't want to embrace electricity because they were afraid that they'd become dependent on it. And um, how many people want to go back to not having electricity? Um, yet um, that's that's kind of like a lot of people will say, well, maybe we should hold off. Maybe we shouldn't invest in this resilient infrastructure because then we have to become dependent on it. Um, where it really we have to see it as the exact opposite because. Other nation states are already, they're already three years ahead of us. Interdependencies that we built that require that we think differently about how do we, how we protect ourselves. And, you know, so war uh, in, in many ways can come to us uh, without uh, an airplane. It can come to us, you know, through an email. It can come to us through, um, you know, a, a physical attack. Um, maybe not even by a nation state on one of those centralized hubs that ends up impacting lives. And so it's something that, that we have to think differently about, you know, protecting ourselves in this, in this world where we created this architecture that we've come to depend on. I don't know, but I believe that, you know, the underlying principles of, of democracy in the United States and the free market um, are probably our greatest weapon. So by creating the right kind of regulatory environment and the right kind of incentives to actually build this network here and manufacture things here in this country, um, we will win, you know, the war, you know, with the tools we already have, right? We don't need to uh, necessarily step in with overarching, um, you know, government intervention and control and, you know, these kinds of things. Um, I'm a firm believer that, uh, that the, the key building blocks are already there. It's just that the right financial and economic incentives have to be in place so that the innovators can innovate and build Industry 4.0 for the next several generations to prosper from. Silicon Valley built with that data repository that they're collecting from your smartphone is the ability to influence your decisions with regard to economics. 
uh, you know, you're, make you a better consumer. What the Chinese Communist Party sees is the ability to make you not only a better consumer, but also to influence your social and political um, behavior as well. So it becomes a way to collect data about you without your consent, without you knowing it, and then you use that data in ways that allow that enables the, 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 the economic, the social and political alteration of your behavior patterns in ways that, quite frankly, are imperceptible to, to uh, citizens. You know, what's, what's most important about 5G and the concepts that are attached to it, like edge computing and machine to machine communication and what have you, is that the, and this is this, at least from my perspective, why, you know, the, the um, Chinese Communist Party is so keenly interested in owning that space, number one, is that it's the foundation on which entire economies can be built. Those telecom net networks are pooling data from where it's collected today in, in states like Iowa and sending it to the coasts. Uh, primarily the West Coast, but also in the East Coast to be processed. And so that creates a very vulnerable infrastructure because all of that data, all those data centers are very centralized. It also creates a particular problem that can't be solved and doesn't enable this next generation of, uh, of the internet or industry 4.0, and that's really latency. Rather than being able to take 25% of the S&P 500 and say, let's concentrate it in Silicon Valley, what we need to do is break that up. And the way we break that up is by bringing the compute closer to where it's needed. And that's really um, what we're talking about in, 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 in infrastructure. And, and right now, today, the, the companies that power the mobile internet don't have an interest in that. The telecoms don't want to bring the, the, the compute closer to so we're, we're firm believers that, you know, the, the next version of what, you know, we in this country build needs to be uh, fundamentally decentralized. The power structure needs to be decentralized. Um, and this, this is giving rise to concepts of peer-to-peer -peer exchanges rather than intermediary driven, right? Don't send me your data and let me broker it. Um, connect directly with those who need it or want it or, or are willing to subscribe to it or need to subscribe to it. Penn developed out of not a pursuit of coming up with a new standard to, to, um, to be deployed. What it came about is we were solving for how do we get the sensors deployed within cities? And um, by the end of 2018, it became clear that the cities were already um, inundated um, with, of course, the carriers wanting to scale 4G networks, 5G networks. And of course, there's a whole bunch of pursuit for, for Wi-Fi, you know, private you know, deployments. So when we started talking to cities about wanting to you know, deploy sensors for intelligent and connected devices, whether it be cars um, and the different radars, the different LIDARs, and the fact of, of the concept of putting edge compute at these facilities and things like assured position navigation and timing, um, they, they immediately were excited about the use cases it would enable, but then had tremendous hesitation because they were already dealing with thousands of permits come into the city to basically strap, bolt, or attach some electronic device to current infrastructure in the city. So, um, you know, we, we can't show images right now, but the, the, some of these cities actually sent images of what happened in the 1930s and 40s during the spike of the electrification and telecommunication. And it was horrendous. These cities were overwhelmed with wires and poles and cables all over the place. And they saw the same thing happening. So that's what, what led to the development to the PIN, the Public Infrastructure Network node of saying, look, there's a lot of interest in a lot of valuable services that need to be deployed in a city, but we need to think about it from like a condo perspective. Like how do we take a, um, a dumb infrastructure, which um, allows multiple technologies to be deployed today, but more importantly, how can it be upgraded effectively over time? A lot of government money's already gone into infrastructure. A lot more needs to go into infrastructure. But rather than, you know, spending money and, and having companies pocket that and, and basically not do anything, we need to have better controls, better monitoring on, and actually it, it, and hold companies accountable if they aren't providing 
the infrastructure build out. And I think that's what we haven't, we've failed to do. Right now we have the FCC designating that broadband is 25 down, three up. I mean, that is like, that is like putting horseshoes on cars. I mean, I just, I, it's just so out of the ballpark where you already have other countries demonstrating that almost all citizens have a gigabit down. I just wonder how many people of other countries just laugh at the concept that we're saying that 25 down is broadband. There's this thin veneer of, of civil society that exists because uh, our systems work. And when our systems stop working, which is one of the tactics in warfare is to make those systems stop, you, you, you end up with chaos. And so it's very important that we secure and harden uh, the, the infrastructure that we're building, particularly um, this uh, digital infrastructure that enables machine to machine and AI and, and, and IoT and all of that. So um, that, that can't be forgotten. This is going to be one of many conversations around this topic, but maybe some closing thoughts from each of you on one major thing top of mind for you that is going to win the stealth war? For, for me, it's really um, awareness. And, and that's why I wrote the book. That's why, you know, I'm, I'm here today. It's people need to understand that um, Marines aren't going to come charging ashore. Uh, you know, we're not going to see bombers overhead anytime soon, but that doesn't mean you're safe. It just means that the war has moved to a different uh, part of the battlefield. And that battlefield is really in your living room. It's really in your hands when it, we come to smartphones. And so you need to understand that. You understand that, um, that we have um, adversaries that seek to undermine our life. The reason they do is because they fear it. They fear giving the citizens the power uh, to achieve their dreams and to really um, have the independence uh, and liberties that we enjoy in this country. And that, and the fact that we enjoy them really becomes uh, a problem that they have to deal with. And, and if they don't continue to maintain control over the narrative, it really becomes a problem for their continued rule. So that the way, the world that we build this globalized internet connected world really makes it easy for them to control the narrative. And in many ways, uh, our divi the division in our society becomes a, a, a way for them to exploit that. And so, it's, a, it's about education, it's about awareness, about understanding the world has changed mm -hmm. and the way that we compete and, and have conflict has changed. It's gone into the digital and the, and the financial realms. And, um, and, and that's why I chose to leave uh, the Air Force. So I think that education awareness then can lead to Americans standing up on their own, in their own way, in their own communities, beginning to make a difference. And I think that's what, that what, that's what needs to happen. Well, luckily, awareness came. Um, a lot of people didn't know what supply chain was until they lost their toilet paper. So I, mean, <laughs> I think we've had a lot of good education um, on other aspects of, of this awareness as well. But I'd say for, from our standpoint, the Autonomy Institute's perspective is, is the realization that the digital and the physical worlds are merging. And, and we're talking about 5G and all these, these new applications coming. There is a physical aspect that has to be deployed to allow that software to run somewhere. I mean, I, th I think too often going back to, to John's point is there was a time that everything ran on mainframes and, and, a, and a handful of, of data centers that ran like Sabre. And then we swung over to, you know, PCs and, and the data centers. And you kind of say that it's kind of swung back a little bit to, to the phones, but this next infrastructure, no one component is going to be dominant, but we are missing that edge infrastructure that allows that software to run somewhere and it's it's very personal it's very much at the sidewalk um, within cities and communities across the, the u.s i think i think as we as we look forward um and it's you know you know we can we can make all the statements we want about you know wanting to compete and wanting to be aware and you know these these kinds of things but ultimately it has to it has to kind of translate into action and, and for me the biggest narrative to watch in the months and years ahead is the one around leveling the playing field. So I'm a globalist, I'm an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, free marketeer, all of those kinds of things. However, you know, that, that paradigm, that philosophy doesn't work um, unless you have bilateral participation. So the minute one side of a negotiation, one side of a transaction no longer respects the rules of engagement, um, the whole thing breaks down. And this is, this, this is what I see happening 
uh, in our internet economies uh, specifically, and it's manifesting itself literally on the streets in this country. Um, and so, you know, until until we can level that playing field, and I don't know what that takes. I don't know if it's policymakers, elected officials. I don't know necessarily what form that takes. But until we can wise up to the fact that we are not playing, um, you know, a, a a bilateral game, and that our adversary is playing chess while we sit here and play checkers. Um, I don't expect anything at a macro level to really change anytime soon. So those are the things that I'm going to be paying close mind to in the years ahead. I think that's great. I think um, leveling the playing field and there's, you know, we're, the conversation is happening. We're in the right direction. And I think eventually I think the goal is we want to tip the narrative back to us. So I'm going to stop there and Thanks, and we'll be um, following up with this soon.